Adam Journal, and I'm here with the Matisans. And for folks who don't know the Matisans, you apparently have not lived in this county long enough. All right. Very sad. You don't know. It's very sad. All right. Let's start with well, let's start with introductions. Let's start. Uh, should we start from? No. Let's start with the sisters because yes. you guys kind of hitched on a little bit later. Yes. All yes. right. Let's go. Who are you? And okay. you don't have to tell me who the older one is. I don't really care. No. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Karen Matisse and Mace. All right. Cindy Matisse and Williams. All right. This is my husband, Haskell Williams. We were married in the Baptist Church right down across the street. All right. And so I'm Roger we're, Mace, and, so, and we were also married there. All right. Did Not you, at the same time. Not at the same time? No. <laughs> we were way ahead. Oh, were you? We're not even going to go into how you all married or how you all met because, yeah, they're, they're laughing. The kids are laughing because they're like, we don't want to hear that story. They've again. heard it enough. There you go. All right. Uh, where do you want to start? Uh, who, who was, well, you, you were the first one, weren't you? Yes. Okay. Tell me your first memory of the clinic, of your dad, of your mom, of, of Chatham County. Um, the clinic, uh, they dedicated the clinic in February 1949. I thought it was 48. Then. 48, maybe so. I was very young, so it's hard. Remember. Pretty sure it was 1948. Um, Look in the and, pictures. Uh, I remember the reception in February uh, when it was dedicated, and uh, that's probably my first memory. And then uh, that Christmas, they had a party at the clinic and the pit for the patients that could be wheeled and walk with help to uh, the spot. And I remember that party, and uh, those are my first memories. So what kind of party was it? I mean... It was a Christmas party. All right. And my dad gave presents out to everybody, and it was exciting. How did your dad, or why did your dad decide to start the clinic? Nine. It was 1949. I'm a know-it-all, but not about that. <laughs> yeah, the kids are shaking their heads, yeah. <laughs> Our... Our, our parents married in California, went to nursing school, our mother and our father, medical school in California. All right. They came to Durham for my dad to intern at Watts Hospital. All right. They were going to go to Peru as medical missionaries. My mother had severe asthma, and they never could go because of her asthma. So they didn't go to Peru, they moved to Pittsburgh because there was no physician at that time in Chatham County. So wait a minute, your mom had asthma and she decided to stick in no, North Carolina she was during real, pollen she was, season? She was so sick, she died in our, our living room one time from asthma, they actually had to revive her. Okay. Um, so he, they decided her health was not good enough to go to Peru. He was afraid to take her out of the country and this country didn't have good asthma emergency treatment either. But, Which is an entree unto his asthma thing. And Yes, but uh, he was afraid to take her out of the country uh, to where he knew he would have no help with an emergency asthma attack. Okay. So your dad decided to set up shop in Pittsburgh. Yeah. But I assume that's not the first time he said, oh yeah, let me come into Pittsburgh and set up a clinic, or was it? Well, well there was no clinic. They moved here no in 1939, they moved here? Yes, yeah. Our oldest brother was born in 1938 in Durham. Okay. And they moved here, and he was a year old. Yes. Yeah. And um, no, there was no clinic for 10 years. So. He, had, he had an office up the street. Right about where, is it Verley's Grill? Yes, Verley's Grill. That was the approximate location of his office, at that, his first office. All right, how many rooms did he have in his first office, or was it just a one-room office? Oh, no, I'm not that old. Go ahead, Karen. You can talk. <laughs> My memory doesn't really kick in on that, but uh, it was uh, a little reception area and an examining, examining room, and there was an x-ray room uh, where he could check on broken bones, you know, take care of people if they thought the bone was broken. And I think your husband mentioned that he used to do house house calls. Oh, extensively. yeah, 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 extensive house calls. He delivered a lot of babies in house calls, even after the clinic was closed. Yes, yes, he did. Oh, yeah. When we would hear the phone ring 
in the middle of the night, but we go right back to sleep. But we knew he was grabbing his medicine bag and his uh, doctor bag and heading out the door to wherever. And do you was. remember what kind of things he had in his medicine bag and his I've doctor bag? I've got them at home. Oh, you do? I do. I, I think those drugs are expired, though, aren't they? Well, there's equipment. <laughs> oh, equipment. Okay, what kind of equipment's in that bag? Well, stuff to draw, draw blood and blood pressure and... And that kind of thing, just basic equipment. Didn't he deliver five thousand babies? I remember him telling it, me. He delivered yes, 5, thousands, babies. thousands. Of but babies. you remember, Karen, when our dad had a heart attack, and um, they had moved to Bryson City, and he was in Asheville at Mission Hospital, and someone came to his room to draw blood, and they pronounced his name right, which not an easy thing to do. Right. And he said, I know you, Dr. Matisson, because you delivered me. <laughs> well, there and was, that was the day before he died. There was, when there was a reunion here, there was, I think, three or four brothers and sisters that T-shirts made up that we were born in the Matisson Clinic and they had the different years on it. So they, I mean, folks seem to be very proud of the fact that they were born in this clinic because at that time, I guess it was... It was the hospital for Pittsburgh, wasn't it? Yeah, but it this was guy old. lived in Asheville. Oh, really? <laughs> well, he had my moved. dad was my dad was in the hospital in Asheville, North Carolina. Okay. He died the next day. But the guy that drew his blood had lived here in Pittsburgh, and my oh. dad delivered him. That's why we pronounced dad's name right, Matisse, which most Mom, people do. Mom, can you tell how he would just take eggs and things? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah he would just take story. payment. She went on the house call with with him. Once, at, well, several times, yes. when he would allow it, I would go. And one early Sunday morning, he allowed me to go in the hospital. And this was a, a patient of his who had heart problems. And so we went into the very poor house, and uh, he took care of the grandmother in the living room on a bed. And when we were leaving, the grown son walked out outside with us. And he said, Doc, I can't, I don't have money to give you anything, but we do have chickens. We have a lot of eggs. And Dad said, we'll go home and fix eggs for breakfast. <laughs> so did you end up having to carry the eggs home? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Lots of them. <laughs> you have a favorite. Did you get to go on any house calls? I did, yes. And what's your favorite house call? Well, I was really little. Usually I slept in the back yes. seat. Oh, okay. While he went inside. Yes. Um, and it was now, what, what, what kind of car did your your, your oh. dad drive? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God's a mercy. Not until I was older. I don't remember cars. But I would only go when mother was working at the clinic and there was no one to stay with me at home because but when I was born the clinic had been built okay so only if he had a house call and I couldn't be left alone I would get in the back seat and sleep while we went out into the country so now were you a Did terror that is that why you can be left alone well I was like three years old oh, okay okay, okay. <laughs> well, one of those house calls well maybe plus we had a brother you understand too we had two older brothers and we had a brother who had Down syndrome, and he would be going go with us. But one time we went on a house call, and she was asleep in the back seat. I sat in the front with Daddy, and it was an uphill climb, and the car was just jumping around. There were deep ruts in that dirt road from, I'm sure, rains. And um, I thought we were going to have to stop and walk. It was like, I don't know, it seemed like miles up there, but it was probably a mile. And I knew we were going to get stuck in a rut, but he made it to the to the house. And uh, we were listening on the radio to Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> and you were asleep in the back seat. <laughs> Did you try to push me out the door? No, Is that what not, you were going not to say? that oh. time. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's stories that we're not going to hear about this afternoon. <laughs> well, well, there was there was one that I heard him tell that uh, a fellow was really really sick. Uh, out on one of these calls and uh, the, it was in the middle of summer and this man had eaten watermelon seeds and all and he had gotten he was, it. had such a fever yeah, yeah. he and got a fever from eating watermelon no, no. no. He, uh, he had a fever and the watermelon was was cooling him oh, and, okay. and hydrating him but uh, all the seeds impacted mm. <laughs> oh has <Haskell>. mm. <laughs> mm. That was the story that was told. He dug out all those seeds, my dad did. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, well, see, my mom used to tell me, don't eat the watermelon seeds. Well, exactly. Because you can have a watermelon grow inside of you. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So, you know, she was right. She was right. See, folks, it's not an urban legend. Uh, so when the clinic was open, opened up, what, what are your memories? Because you said you were the younger one and you were the older one. So well, yeah. Were you like clinic rats? In, we were. Of okay. course, I was not born when the clinic was open. Right. I, it, I, I was born three years later. But, yes, we were. We spent a lot. And then, of course, when I got older, I remember when um, Medicare in, was enacted and I, Mrs. Poole taught me how to bill for Medicare. I was in high school, and you taught me how to bill for Medicare. Um, and when I went into nursing school, I would help my dad in the um, in the summers. I would help him in the clinic. Did you become a nurse in part because of what your dad and mom were doing? Yeah, but you know what? We had our brother who had Down syndrome. He was older than Karen, so he was older than me. But he was our baby, right? Yes. Yeah. We loved that boy. What was his name? His name was Stanley. He was precious. He was a precious, precious yeah, boy. Ahead. Had bright red hair like Karen. Of course, it's brighter. <laughs> oh my gosh, these sisters are picking at each other. <laughs> yeah. And um, Did so you listen to this all the time. Yeah, the kids are going. Yeah. <laughs> so he was our precious brother. So I don't know what I was saying about him, except that I became a nurse and I was a diabetes educator specialist. And um, that was because he had very severe type 1 diabetes. And um, I learned how to give his insulin shots when I was 10. Yeah. And um, so I took care of, we took care of our brother because our mom and dad worked. Yeah, we would have suspicion that something wasn't right about him. We'd call mother at the clinic and she would say, well, test his uh, sugar. And so we Of course, would, it wasn't blood sugar at the no, time. No, no. It was urine sugar. And uh, if she would tell us if he needed insulin, give him so many units of insulin, and we'd give him the shot. Yeah. Now, did you become a nurse as well? I did. Okay. She was also a teacher. She's yeah. smarter than me. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not at so all. So were you a teacher before you became a nurse or a nurse teacher, or you nurse did both first. at the same time? Nurse, nurse first. Nurse first? Yeah. Um, okay. At the clinic, we... I also hung around the clinic like she did, and I would go up in the kitchen upstairs <clears throat> when they were preparing food for the patients, and they're the ones that got me hooked on um, mayonnaise and banana sandwiches, mm -hmm. and to this day, that's my favorite sandwich. Mayonnaise and banana sandwiches. Now, what kind of bread do you put it on? Well, they put it on white bread, but I usually... She tries to eat smarter. Than I try. You try to eat smarter. Favorite, favorite story, favorite memory from the clinic? Well, when she was, I don't know, two years old, I was pushing, mother had to I run into I don't think I was two. No. I wasn't that old. Well, she was in the stroller behind the clinic, and mother had to run in for something. And she left, <laughs> She's telling on herself, I'm not telling her. And story. I was pushing, mother said, push Cindy around in the driveway, which was gravel at that time. It's very hard to push a stroller around and grab. You had a, lot, a tough life. She yeah. did. God bless her. And I got so tired. My mother stayed and stayed, and I got so tired of pushing her around in the stroller that I pinched her so she would cry, and then I rolled her into the clinic, and I said, Mother, she's, she's crying. You need to take care of her. <laughs> Oh my goodness. There's nothing about the clinic. <laughs> no, it's a good clinic story. I it mean. was behind the clinic. <laughs> it was behind the clinic. And Do you I, remember anything better than that? I was repenting. That? I have repented. She's very you sweet. Repent? Have you repented or repinched? <laughs> no repinching. No repinching. She's, yeah, she's she can right knock you here. out now. Yeah. Uh, actually, did you have any hiding places in the clinic, or, or did you do any make-believe? Or I mean, I remember as a kid, I used to build... Uh, Castles out of sheets. Did you do anything ridiculous, or you were, or, or you all fine, refined Southern ladies? Very refined. Very refined. <laughs> Never did anything wrong. Oh my! <laughs> she pinched me for crying out loud. I wasn't even two years old. I, mean, I grew up hearing tons about the clinic and the, just how much fun they had at the clinic. And we did. Um, they loved going to the clinic, and I mean, pop. I, we call um, my grandparents Papa Grand. Um, mm -hmm. This all is of my daughter. Grandkids, but. I mean, I know they always were at the clinic, so... We were. It was like, well, I mean, it was Pop and Grant's life. Yes. And 
they live to just serve, you know, that's really, even when I was growing up, um, they didn't live here, but I remember that's all my grandparents did. You know, it was always take care of patients and help others. I mean, that's what they, day or night, people would call around the clock. And their mission. I remember yeah. you saying that your dad only slept very few hours a night, right. three or four hours a night, if that, you know, that was kind of the average. So when do you first remember your grandparents? I mean, I have very young memories of them, and I always remember my grandparents just working, um, and and I would love to go to their, the doctor's office they worked at in Bryson City, and my grandmother would let me call back patients, and that was <laughs> oh, super exciting, and um, so it was, I always thought about thought of them as just their people that sacrifice everything for helping others. They didn't go on fancy vacations. No. They gave away anyone who needed uh, money, needed anything. I remember Grand buying girls prom dresses, and you know that was just kind of how they lived, and that's why they were here. Is I remember yeah. hearing my whole life is this this area needed a doctor, and that's why they chose it. Yeah, and. If patients could pay, they paid. But if they couldn't pay, Daddy just let it go. So you ate a lot of eggs in your lifetime. We did. We did. Well, there's nothing wrong with eggs. Well, <laughs> it was estimated by Dr. Jakes after Dr. Matheson died that uh, he forgave or didn't collect over five million dollars. Two million. Dollars. It was two million. Oh, I two, read it wrong. Oh, two. Two oh, million. Two million dollars. Over but his he, time he here. never mentioned it. Never was yeah, mentioned. It wasn't coming from him. It was coming from his associate doctor. And going through their things. Yeah. Uh, after they passed away, there's going through boxes and boxes. I would ask, it's like, where did this come from? It's like a patient gave that to them. A patient gave that to him. So their things were mostly things that they didn't buy. They're things they gave them as a kindness of them being showed by by being a patient at the doctor's office. So you had a lot this, of mismatched uh, furniture in the house. This was yeah. <laughs> this is this is my son. Uh, yes. Do you have any memories of Granddaddy or Pop? Did you call pop. Him pop. Yeah, Pop. pop. Yeah. So pop. they both worked um, in their 70s, and I remember That's them as amazing. being they were um, always giving. They always would buy us what we needed. If we had a if we needed something and you ask them, they would always say yes. They're just like a typical grandparent, um, but they would go to extend my. They they helped me put me through. Helped me put through school. Um, did you become a nurse? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> I did. I did take uh, theology and history. Fathered my fa father as a pastor, but I didn't become a pastor. I'm in the technology field now, but. Um, so you rebelled against. I the rebelled. Family. Yeah, I guess. Okay. <laughs> but I'm not in the Two medical things. field. One, I have two one, things, yeah, after he's done. One, one thing that uh, I've often asked myself, where did he get his energy, his breadth of knowledge? He was, he could, he could, uh, you know, we both have graduated from the seminary. This guy, he knew things that uh, I'm yet discovering. Uh, what Bible? he wrote about and what he studied, underlined in his theological books. He knew theology. And he, he could dialogue with any person of any faith quite, uh, uh, quite well when it came to knowledge. But that wasn't his, I mean, he was an avid stamp collector. He was, he was a gardener. Oh, uh, my, he was yes. a rose gardener on top he's of that. He's the one that started the uh, Pittsburgh Rose Society, Chatham, Chatham County Rose Society, back and, in the 60s. He was also mayor for a period of time in, um, in Pittsburgh. Mayor of Pittsburgh for a period, I don't know how long, but for a period of time? I think a couple of terms. A couple of terms. But what, what gave me the answer was we as a family went to Colorado this uh, past summer. summer where he grew up. He grew up on a ranch with his uh, grandfather and his father as ranchers. And his father want, had, had become a medical doctor, but he said, uh, don't go into medicine because you can make more as a rancher. He said, no, I'm going to go to California and I'm going to be a doctor. And he said, when I he, don't care about the money. I just want to help people. And and he, uh, when, when I looked at what that area of Colorado was like where the cattle, 
you know, they used to send them up to Wyoming. Uh, I thought, how could somebody survive here? How could somebody live here? Nothing but desert. The, there was no grass. They were well, just like they were having a drought last summer. But uh, his whole family, uh, his uh, uncles and aunts, all went into the medical field. So there are lots of Matisse and doctors on the West Coast. He chose to come east, and uh, and I think that his upbringing has something to do with that fortitude, that uh, that ability, to, uh, that stamina to keep working and to keep his mind was always working on learning new things. He's you have a story. Well, I have before, a before we go to story, let me ask because you briefly mentioned uh, the fact that he he highlighted, took notes, and everything. Do you think his belief system, or how did his belief system fit into him being a doctor? I mean... Uh, well, he graduated from what is called the uh, College of Medical Evangelists, which is under the, uh, the umbrella of Loma Linda University. Oh, so if we refer to it as Loma Linda University. But when he, when he said uh, medical evangelist, that meant his, he believed that he was trained to believe study that he was a he was a doctor to the whole person so his personality his beliefs on, uh, on uh, uh, the right kind of diet the right kind of living the lifestyle all had to be taken into consideration even their spiritual needs so he was a doctor that uh, was interested in the whole person and I think that was one of the big things that caused people to uh, enjoy his visits with them is because he could he could address so many areas of their life. So it sounds like he wouldn't just tackle the physical issues, That's but right. also the spiritual ones. That's right. All right, now no, let's, get, this let's is, get to your this story. This is not really a story because, first of all, my parents, and we all are, Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. So when the, he came here, there was only one other family that were Seventh-day Adventists, and they started, built a church down here. You may know where the Seventh-day Adventist church is, down the street. Yeah, and just they beyond, built that church. Just west of 87. Yes. just um, So he, start, he and the Thomases started that church. Um, the other thing is the private adoptions that my, do, my father and mother, because my mother helped him deliver all these babies, that were adopted, babies that were adopted because of mothers who couldn't keep their babies, and he found homes for them. Um, and when our brother, who had Down syndrome, for a while he lived in um, Greensboro with the superintendent of schools for that county, and they had, they knew my parents because they had adopted one of his babies. Not, he didn't, he was not the father of the baby, but. How, how'd, your, how'd your dad, was that going again back to the spiritual part? Yeah. He just felt that, he, that there he, was a need for it. And yes. I guess no one back then was really promoting There was stuff. no other, you didn't get babies through the county back then. Um, now, our oldest child who was here last summer and was in the picture you took of babies born here, um, she's adopted. She was one of his private adoptions for us. And um, Wade Barber, who is the law attorney here, um, facilitated our private adoption. Yeah, Wade's been here for ages. Yes. So, so um, yeah, he facilitated, and Carolee Eubanks, who was his secretary, they helped us and talked us into naming her April. <laughs> and um, But she was, my dad delivered her, and um, my mom was in the delivery room. We lived in Michigan. He called me, my mother called me and said, we have your baby, and I heard her crying in the delivery. That is that is a neat connection. So there, so he, I don't know how many hundreds of babies he adopted. The pictures I have, I have a picture of me holding Joyce Marie, I named her Joyce Marie, um, that was adopted, a private adoption. I mean, it wasn't under the table. My dad was not paid anything. He delivered these babies took care of moms before they delivered and then found them good Christian homes. But You, um, you were dying to say something. I but Mary that. Elizabeth Peck was one of the, one of the babies. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I believe our daughter is, was perhaps the last child born in, yeah. the, in, the clinic. in the clinic. She might have been. Coming back here to the clinic 
today. Uh, I know it's kind of a cliche question, but what are your feelings? What are your memories? Are you feeling happy, sad? It's just, I mean, I'm asking you a bunch of questions, so, but. Uh, well, it's nostalgic, but it it's happy memories. I only had happy memories around the clinic, and of course I hung around in the summer a lot, after school, in the evenings, until Mother could take us home, and they're all happy memories. Now, besides the, the uh, pinching your sister incident, were there any, any other things you used to do that got you kind of in trouble or made your mom or dad call you by your full three names? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of those. <laughs> um, no, I was just... She was so good. Yeah. Other than the she pinching was the angel, episode. Wasn't she? <laughs> I wouldn't share them if they were. <laughs> but I did share, I did pinch her, I admit, one time. Just one time. Just one time. Uh, let me direct a question to the gentleman. Did you ask Dr. Matheson ahead of time for your wife's hands in marriage? Yes. And how did that conversation go? Well, I was I was scared. Uh, no, <laughs> you need <doc> to be. <laughs> doc Dr. Matisson, uh who was a very generous man, um, um, followed uh, principles very very carefully. Um, but he was he had a, a stern presentation. He was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was I was rather shaking when okay. when I asked permission. And did you ask in, in, in person, and did, did your mom know about it as well, or was it just dad know. that knew about it? I wasn't there. It? <laughs> I wasn't there. Uh, it was actually, as we were going to college, we were in, in college, okay. and uh, moving her in, and I, and I asked him there. And I assume the answer was, y you're okay. He, he allowed me. Now, I, I have to tell you, <laughs> I, I had already made a strong impression on him, because one of the first... <laughs> One of the first times that I came to visit Here, uh, up at, the house, uh, up there. at the house, right up on Hillsborough, <laughs> I pulled in kind of to the side as as I was leaving. A friend and I had come down to see our, our girlfriends, um, and I started backing out on Sunday, heading back to home, and I heard <laughs> something. So I stopped, and I had pushed o near his rose garden, had pushed over the stand pipe with a spigot on it. So... He, my friend motioned me forward. Cindy was standing to the side there, and my friend straightened it up to try to correct it. Well, uh -huh. at that point, the pipe broke, and so there is a geyser. <laughs> and so on my first visit, I made a strong impression on him. Later, um, I was driving the, the, the uh, family truck. It had a topper on the back, and there is a port <laughs> cashier uh, at the side of the house where they kind of a carport. And... Um, I drove the truck back into the uh, into the place. What I didn't know is there was more clearance on the left side than on the right side, and I reshaped the topper. Right. So Cindy drives most of the time now. <laughs> <laughs> so I I had already made a strong impression on him by the time I asked for her, her right, hand so in marriage. Same question to you. Yes. Well, I I remember it well. Uh, we were sitting in the living room. Her mother. And Did you break any pipes? No. Okay. I, 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 <laughs> he was the good guy. good son-in-law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, it, it was a scary proposition, you know, and I took a long time. And, it, you was know, it was almost getting, midnight, and I kept looking late. at him. I knew he was going to ask my folks, and I kept looking, and I thought, We're, they're going to go to bed before you say anything. <laughs> so I, I finally uh, asked uh, them, ask now this father. is after before they th was this while they're still awake or did you have to yeah. wake them up they, and say they, sorry they were sir still awake. they okay. were very patient and uh, so when I s asked the question uh, her mother says you don't want to marry her she can't even cook she doesn't like to travel you know or move because <laughs> you're going to be a preacher you, she's going to be you're moving all the time <laughs> and I said, well, on the cooking thing, can she read? And they, she said, yes, well, then, then I think I'm okay. It, you, he said, she, then she can read a cookbook and yeah. learn. And she has. She <laughs> is a good cook. Here's the important question. Has she ever pinched you? <laughs> yeah, probably. No, I don't, no. I don't have her. We're not, not going to go. <laughs> All right. We're at 30 minutes right now, so we can either wrap this up or if you don't mind, go another five minutes, which would you... Like, like to finish up with 
like your favorite story or or you know what? Why don't we why don't we go with uh, for folks that didn't know your dad, who didn't have the experience, because there's there's a for the folks who have been born in, in the hospital, who are aware of your family, aware of your dad and the clinic and your mom, they are happy that Matisse and Clinic and your folks were part of the community. Is there something for, I mean, there's a lot of folks moving into Chatham County these days, and there are some folks who have been here for a while, but never, I mean, the clinic, as you mentioned, had been closed down for a while. So is there anything that you would say to somebody who didn't know your parents that they should know about your parents? I thought we've said it. Dedicated, generous, um, work to a fault. Very spiritual. Very spiritual. Um, their mission was to help people and not to do it in any flamboyant way, just daily, not to announce it, just do for people. So, I mean, and they were very strong into us being educated. Our oldest brother was a physician, um, and of course, Stanley was not able to. Our oldest brother was Marlon, he was a junior. And then Stanley, of course, went to school until he was 18, and at the time, the state did not um, let children with Down syndrome go to school any longer. Um, <clears throat> uh, Karen and I both went to college. She went, got to, she was a nurse and then a teacher, a Bachelor of Science. I got a Bachelor of Science, and then they sent me on to get my master's degree. They wanted all that for us. In the time that your dad was a doctor and the clinic was open, were there any cases or health situations or spiritual situations where he felt that that it was an accomplishment to be able to do what he, he did. Was there a case that was a difficult case that maybe he helped somebody out? You mentioned the fact that he, he helped folks adopt children. Were there any other things that he was especially proud of? Well, being the only doctor uh, other than times when there was a partner here, um, he handled, this was this was emergency room, this was anything. You were telling a story about a young girl. Had got I was in his, in his office and right across the hall was uh, his uh, treatment room for, for trauma or whatever. And uh, the door was open and he was operating on a little uh, girl's foot that had gotten caught under a lawnmower. And he was, he was doing something that I uh, thought was way beyond what most doctors would be willing to do, except to have a, a specialized surgeon to do that. And he was doing it very confidently. I mean, he was very careful, and he, could, he would not, he would tackle anything because he knew that that was the only chance this child had to to help her with with that emergency, he went up. He had uh, the accidents on the, the main road here. Uh, they would come to this clinic, and they would be overwhelmed by many accident victims, victims that they had to uh, take care of. And there were uh, no ambulances, no 911. The yeah. funeral home would use Griffin their first. The hearse to go pick up emergency situations but and you, bring them in. Yeah, that was before Chapel Hill opened their their uh, hospital. So back so, then, if I got hurt, the hearse would come and pick me if up. You, if you but or your family common. couldn't get you in, like an accident on the road, they would go and bring the patients in. But my dad prayed with his patients, and he had a, a very gentle heart toward his patients and he wanted to do everything he could for them and he, encourage them. He had a large uh, a large presence but but in that large presence there was a healing presence that for him to be taking care of you he uh, he just uh, had this uh, presence of I'm here to help you I can do this for you I can help you and uh, the, the patients would be able to put their confidence in him that he knew what he was doing to lessen their anxiety about being uh, in his presence.
presence. Now, how does that max, uh, match up with that terrifying personality you were talking <laughs> I about? I said terrifying. Oh, did you? <laughs> not, not him. He didn't say that. Um, the, part of it was his confidence. Uh, part of it was some of the austerity th that he grew up in. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yet, I, 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 it was just a big question to be asking him for, for his daughter's hand in marriage. And it, I think most guys would experience that at, at that point. <laughs> so I got a feeling you prayed before you asked him for your, for oh, your yes. wife's hand in marriage. Oh, that. yes. Uh, one thing that he paid a big price by being a doctor because of the faulty x-ray machine and he developed cancer in his hands, he had to have surgery and he battled that for, for many years. He would have to go to New York and, and uh, these Duke, medical Duke uh, treatment. That's right, they didn't take the same precautions they do now with x-ray, plus I think they were was, way more powerful than they are. He had a defective machine. It's oh, a defective, defective machine. And, and it affected he handled the, the, he hands, the handles on the machine with his hands turning, and so he got radiation burns that he, went. he had to have a mastectomy on his right side. Mm -hmm. Fingers the, removed. The machine uh, went once. The, the you think of uh, a machine, and they'll say uh, you'll, they'll push a button, and there's a momentary exposure. Right. This, it, whenever the machine was turned on, it was emitting, and so his hands holding the the, the, the film, uh, positioning the patient, he was getting he was getting. Massive yeah. exposure. So he was getting dosed every time he was yes, doing that, right. not yeah. just that flip of the switch. Right. So yes. he went to Duke for surgery, and then they sent him to Sloan Kettering Memorial Hospital in New York. We made many trips to New York mm -hmm. City when mm -hmm. he had treatment. And um, so he had many sur lots of surgeries, and then later he had, um, he had cancer my whole life. Yeah. Yes. I was 12 when yeah. he first had his first. Yeah. But, you know, he kept going. Mm -hmm. He would. Uh, Very determined. Just determined to keep going and serving the people. So he, um, but he died of a heart attack, but it was because he had developed um, cancer in his spine. And they gave him in Asheville um, a, I mean, it was fine. He, he agreed with it. It was. Um, a medication that was not, you know, it was a, what is trial? It was a trial right. medication. I'm sorry, I lost presence of mind. It was under trial, and um, so it was a result of that. And they knew that it could cause clots, and it did. And he he died from that. Well, I do appreciate your time this afternoon. I hope people enjoy watching. There is there anything else you would like to say to conclude this conversation that we've had about? Matisson Clinic, about your dad, about your, your father-in-law. Uh, you guys seem to have turned out all right, and the grandkids seem to have turned out all right. They're well. really nice. Mm -hmm. I've got three children as well. They're oh, not do here. You? Okay. We do. We have three and children. And we have three children. Two of They're them not are all here. here. You, right. you saw two So you like having competition to see who had the most kids? Or? Well, you know, for this month, we have, she has Katrina. I have two daughters that are 11 months apart. One of them adopted. They're all the same age. Oh, okay. Right yeah. now, they're the same age, exactly. But one of the things that I especially appreciate and excited about that this town still remembers him, and and is just as excited as we are about learning, about recalling that history. And we feel honored to, yes, to be very here with so. this. Thank uh, you. And I would. Uh, I would conclude with this. One of the strong things that drove him was was deep spiritual values. And I, I look forward to the Resurrection Day when I will see him again. Yes, right. So, so our dad and our dad was cremated and mother um, was living with our brother when she died. So they're buried in Greenville, Tennessee. But our brother and relatives are here at How Hank's Chapel. How far apart were they between the time your dad passed away? Four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. He and I lost a parent every four years until our mother died, 2003. It, it sounds like your mom and dad led, led a, a good Christian life and that they raised a couple of, well, several good kids and you managed to find Thank you. good spouses. You're very spouses. kind. <laughs> I will tell you, he sent many many children to 
kids church school and to and pay for them to go to college. It was not just us. Of course, we worked at college, right? We yeah. we yeah. we earned, but um, he sent a lot of kids to school, not just us by any stretch. And maybe it helped helped uh, others to med school beyond yeah. beyond our family. My favorite story about Stanley uh, <laughs> is that uh, one of the ladies that was working, you know, washing the sheets and using back in those days lye so, to wash the, which, the sheets, uh, came strong. upstairs and said, Stanley, my hands are just heating up, you know, they just are burning, you know, from that. And hanging on the wall is a picture of, of Christ at the wheel of a, of a ship in a storm. And uh, he said, uh, I want you, to, Stanley told us, look at that picture up there, and I'm going to pray for you. And, and he prayed for, prayed her, for her. He prayed for her hand, for her healing. And when she opened her eyes, her hands were clean. And yes. I can't believe any other than that was a miracle. And he was able to, in his simple uh, uh, way, be able to capture that kind of spirit and, and, and be able to help somebody with it. Years later, uh, my son was visiting the uh, son of the artist mm -hmm. up in Vermont. Harry Anderson, and uh, it, his car had broken down, which I am so thankful his car broke down. It gave me an excuse to go up to pick him up. So when I went into the home of the, where the son was living, the grandmother was living there because Harry Anderson, the artist, had died. And she said, come with me. And I followed her up to the bedroom on that wall was the original copy of that painting. That was the most spiritual moment I've ever had. And it all started somewhere else, you know. And Stanley Stanley caught With it. Stanley. He was a precious boy. He was. Yeah, I was going to say I, I appreciate you spending this time sharing the stories. Uh, and you're right, a lot of people in the community still remember your dad. Um, the turnout that came out here for the reunion People were hugging on each other, enjoying each other, um, and as I mentioned to you, we did get a, a group picture of them all out there. There will be, I think it's a 16 by 32 print that will be hanging in the lobby. Uh, Mr. Greg Stafford, who's redoing that building, uh, is getting it framed to go up there. So thank you so very much. And we thank him for, for restoring the yes. Yes, facility. And yeah. for us being able to see it today. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.